Okay. Good morning, everyone. It looks like it's nine o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started here. Give me one second. I'm going to share my screen so you can see. All right. I let a couple more people in here, and I think we are good. All right. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Um, we are going to talk about um, EMIS this morning and getting um, the next fiscal year started. I can't believe it's already that time of year again, um, but it is. So here we go. Um, again, you know, if you go to our meetings and trainings page, you know, uh, um, August 9th here. I will be posting the recording um, after this morning's session here. Um, and then I have a supporting document that I want to go over and that will be posted um, here as well. So we will go ahead and get started with talking about EMIS and um, everything districts need to do to get started um, for the upcoming um, initial staff um, and course reporting collection. I did want to point out that um, hopefully all of you are, are familiar, but you know, out on um, DEW, I can't get used to saying that. Um, so you might catch me saying ODE and, and just out of habit. So I apologize for that. Um, but they do have their um, calendar, um, you know, out on there under the EMIS reporting responsibilities. Um, they do have their EMIS data collection calendar schedule. Um, posted. So under the 2024-25 um, option, if you click on that, you'll see that the initial staff and course collection opens up um, September 5th. So we do have, you know, a little bit of time yet. Um, that's why we kind of wanted to get ahead of the game and, and talk about those things um, that districts need to do prior to that date. Um, I did want to point out that the final staff course collection for fiscal year 24 um, that did close this week so hopefully all your districts you know got everything reported as needed um, because that did close on the 7th all right um again just going back to the the uh, dw's website um you know hopefully all of you are familiar with the EMIS manual. Um, so, you know, I use this all the time when, you know, there's questions that come in, you know, how does ODE want this reported and so forth. You know, we really rely on, you know, how, o how DEW wants it reported. So, you know, getting it from the source or the EMIS manual is always best. So again, you know, they have the current manual um, the, the staff records are what, you know, you're going to be most concerned with when it comes to staff reporting, and that's in Chapter 3. So it's broken out then by the different record types, um, and then, you know, they have the manual for fiscal year 25. So you can click on any of those, you know, parts, and that'll take you to that specific section in the, in the document, and hopefully, you know, that will be a good place to start to get your questions answered. We do have then our own sort of checklist and that's what basically what we're gonna be covering um, this morning. And that's in our doc USPS documentation um, within the USPS and EMIS connections um, uh, option. We have the staff and course collection checklist. So those of you that were um, able to listen last week when we talked about wrapping fiscal year 24 up in the final staff and course collection. Um, I mentioned that we've kind of combined the, this checklist for collection L into one. So you'll no longer see two different options. If I go back and um, click on that USPS and EMIS connection link, you can see now we just have the one checklist. So 
I see there's a missing a T there. We'll get that fixed. So it's broken um, down between the two uh, initial and final collection. It's broken into two different parts. So the first section, you'll see the initial. And then if I scroll all the way down here, you'll see the final. So basically, you know, if districts are keeping their information current and up to date, um, throughout the school year, there's just a few extra elements that they need to be concerned about when it comes to the final staff and course collection. So, you know, it really is one collection broken up into two different parts. So that's what kind of our, you know, thinking behind combining those. So there is just one checklist now when it comes to the um, staff and course collection reporting. So just to reiterate, you know, at the, at the top, you know, hopefully all of you have been, you know, you're familiar with um, the redesign um, and the new system. And you know now that there, there are three elements that make up reporting um, an employee and their what used to be job screen, for those of you that know classic terms, their um, position slash compensation record. So there's um, a checkbox on the employee record there's a checkbox on the position record, and there's a checkbox on the compensation record. So all three of those are important and need to be checked in order to get this employee's information and their position and job information or compensation, excuse me, reported correctly, okay? Um, because we no longer override compensations like we did in Classic um, when a new contract is created, and that's actually activated. It doesn't override the existing compensation. It actually creates a new one. Um, we have to take some extra steps at the beginning of the year to get the right records reported. Okay. So, you know, knowing that all three of those parts come into play, um, you know, is important. Um, and we're going to talk about getting those records you know, updated to the correct compensation here in a second. Um, the first thing that, you know, will need to be done either by at the district level or, you know, someone at the ITC. I know every ITC handles this a little differently. So again, this is just a checklist, you know, to provide guidance. And then you might have your own at the ITC level that, you know, specifically addresses um, step one. And that is getting the EMIS configuration uh, fiscal year set correctly. So to show you where that is, if I go to the system option and then I go to configuration, there's an EMIS reporting configuration. This needs to be updated to reflect 2025, okay? Everything, as we, as we all know, is date-driven. So in, in order to get the right records, reported correctly, this date needs to be updated. And I would say that if, you know, once the reporting window is open, if you have districts reach out to you and say, hey, my, you know, records, my new employees aren't appearing, or I have multiple records being um, reported for, you know, employees, chances are this fiscal year is not set correctly. So, um, you know, if if they reach out to you with that question, this is the first thing I would check. So this needs to be set to 2025. Next is what we were just talking about, and that's getting all of last year's um, compensations updated to no longer be reported. So again, as we mentioned, those are, are no longer those records no longer get overwritten by a prior year's compensation. So we have to do something to actually get those records either a archived or update those to be no longer reported. So I think, you know, generally speaking, most districts just kind of take the easy way out, so to speak, and they just archive all of those records. So obviously this is something that can't be done until you know, the, all those compensations from last year have been paid completely. So you want to be mindful of that as well. Um, but once that time rolls around and those have been, you know, paid 
the 24th pay, the 26th pay, whatever it may be, um, there is, you know, an easy way to get those records not reported for um, 2025, and that's by archiving those. Um, otherwise, you will have to go in, you know, individually um, or use the um, mass load option to get those reported um, or unchecked, those boxes unchecked, so they're not reported. Um, for those, IT uh, yes. Hey, this is Andrew at Wilco. Hey, so I want to just just clarify. So archiving them, we don't have to archive and uh, unreportable. Like archiving basically makes them unreportable. That's correct. Great question. Okay. I'm sorry if I didn't say that quite correctly, but archiving them is the the by archiving them they will no longer be reported. So um, okay. if you archive those, look, that's like the easy easy way to not not have those records be pulled in. Um, okay. We so have been doing both through mass change because I didn't know you like yeah, we would no. turn them off and then archive them. So you're saying we can just archive them and that's that's correct. It okay. it was at one time, Andrew, that we weren't excluding archived records, but that yeah. has been updated and changed. So you do not Maybe have to uncheck un yeah. the flag and uh, archive them. You know that okay. extra step isn't necessary. Cool. Um. So there, yeah, there was there was a, a a question about you know it doesn't hurt anything, and that's absolutely correct. We, you know, it's not hurting anything, obviously. And somebody, you know, made the suggestion that you know they do both just in case, and that's perfectly okay. The double, double, uh, you know, not double checking, but taking an extra step is is always good. <laughs> so I can understand that. All right, so. Um, again, you know, there is a, a mass change option um, to allow archiving. So, you know, for those of you that, you know, do allow your districts to use that the mass change option, I know there's some ITCs that that restrict that at the ITC level, and that's that's perfectly okay too. You know, the key is obviously just to be extra cautious with um, the records that you have, you know, filtered on your screen to make sure that those are truly only the only records that you want to archive. Um, I know sometimes before using the mass change option, a lot of times districts run a re or, you know, you or the district will run a report um, before um, so that you know exactly, you know, what was changed when that um, execute option was, was run or clicks so that you have some kind of backup um, to fall back on if, if need be, or, you know, back, back kind of an audit trail, because we don't have that ability yet. So again, you know, using dates or using, um, you know, the label or a description um, to only get those that records that um, you truly want to archive and then click on the mass change option. And that's going to allow you then to use that um, load that definition that's out there that says archive equals true to actually archive those um, last year's records. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Next is um, to actually clear out any long-term illnesses um, that apply to last year. So obviously we kind of want to start from scratch, so to speak, so everybody you know, those that long term illness field on the employee record is set back to zero um, and somebody doesn't get misreported. Um, when it comes to, you know, at the year end when you are truly reporting those. So, again, <clears throat> you can use the mass change option. So if I go back to. Um, <clears throat> the employee record, I got a little tickle there. And I have those long-term illnesses, you know, pulled up on, on my grid or that column, I'm sorry. And if I filter this to be greater than zero, you can see all of the employees then that have a value in that field. Now, if you just have a handful of employees, you know, it might be easiest just to edit the record and clear those values out. But if there are several, um, there is a mass change option that's available, again, 
making sure that your grid only, you know, includes those that you want changed. You can click mass change. And then there's an option that says clear employee long-term illness. So by, you know, using that, selecting that definition, and then you execute, it's going to set then those values to zero. So it clears those out <clears throat> automatically for you. All right. So that's clearing out long-term illnesses. Again, you know, if you have a handful of employees, it might just be easier to edit the record once you've um, uh, filtered the grid and just clear those out. Next is incrementing um, the long-term, or I'm sorry, not long-term illness, the experience field. So we're talking about the total experience, authorized experience, and the principal's experience. So those that have been with the district, you know, as of last year, they need a value added to um, their experience fields. So again, we have um, a, a mass change definition um, that can be used to add, you know, one to um, those employees that you wish to update. Um, again, it's important that, you know, you have only those employees that you want updated. And I know that can be tricky with um, those employees that you um, just that maybe just have been entered into the system. So those new to the, the school year, um, we don't want to, we want to be cautious and not be adding um, about a year of experience to those new employees. They have to wait until the year's complete um, to, to get that year um, added. So we can use the advanced, um, you know, you can filter the grid again, you know, using um, something that's, that's helpful, last paid date, um, termination date, um, you know, you know, so that you're not grabbing those employees that don't need to be changed. Um, I do want to, we've had some reports recently of the advanced query um, in this filtering not working quite, prop, quite, quite right. I know that we have a JIRA issue out there. I just, I, it must be a sporadic thing because I am not able to reproduce what is being reported. And I'm not saying that you know, it's not happening because obviously we have a an issue out there and it it um, was determined that it was a problem. But say, for instance, I want to filter out those that do not have a termination date. I can use that advanced query option and I can select that value, that field that I want to um, perform the advanced query on. And it's the is null um operation that has been, you know, giving you guys some trouble. So if I select the is null on the termination date and I click apply query, it seems to be working for me when I've, when I've, you know, tried it. Again, obviously there's an issue. Has anybody else that's on today's call had the same experience? Because we've had this reported I think two or three times in the last couple of days. And maybe there's just a click or something that I'm not doing that others are that are causing the problem. Okay. Well, hopefully, um, you know, you're not, you won't experience what has been reported um, and it, it will work for you. I know that Again, it's it's been reported, so it's happening. I just can't quite reproduce it. Um, so again, you can filter the your grid, um, you know, using that advanced query um, for maybe a termination date. So we we kind of, you know, get rid of those employees that are no longer with the district. You know, maybe filter on a last paid date greater than, you know, something, and then we can use the mass change option again um, to, okay, I apologize. I thought I had, oops, let's go back to me. That's phone. I thought I had that. Let me close this out. Hmm. 
Let me give this one more try. Let's see here. Okay, we don't have anything in there. All right, well, I lied. I thought I had that definition there. Um, but going back to um, the checklist, I apologize. If you need to um, import that definition, you know, the, the scripts are here. The experience, the total experience. Um, and then when it comes to the principle, we don't have an option for that. You'll just, you know, usually it's just a handful of those employees um, that are affected by, you know, or needing that um, updated. So you can just, again, filter your grid. I'm going to clear this. And again, you can use the last pay date to, um, you know, only get those uh, principles that are maybe currently working with the district. And then you can filter that by, you know, something greater than zero, and then go in and actually just edit and update that principal field for those that apply, um, since that usually only involves a handful of, of employees. Okay, those experience fields, I'm sure you're all aware of that, but they're in um, on the employee record in the experience field. So we're talk talking about the authorized, um, the principal, and the total. Those are the three fields that will want to be updated, um, you know, at the start of the year, and then they're left alone or until next year at this time. Okay. You can also use mass load. So if, um, you know, you're not wanting to use mass change, you can use the mass load option. Um, and we've kind of stepped you through um, the options that, that will need to be, the columns, I'm sorry, that will need to be on your grid. Um, again, you can use that um, advanced query to, you know, maybe filter out those that have a terminated date or, um, you know, and then use that last paid date to get current employees. Um, you'll want to extract that then in um, the Excel field names format. Um, that should be the column headings should be extracted in the exact manner that they need to be um, used to be loaded back in. Um, so that will do that part of you know the the work for you. You'll save it as a CSV file, and then you're going to um, brought, use the mass load option and use that importable entity um, of a, of employee, and then you'll load that. So. Again, those can be updated one of two ways. And I know, again, um, for whatever reason that uh, advanced query wasn't working for, for some of you. So we'll, we'll look into that and see what's going on. All right. Um, again, on the employee record, um, under the state reporting option, there's the degree type and the semester hours. So this, you know, will need to be updated for any employees that, that that's, you know, applicable to. So we have um, the semester hours and the degree type, again, under that state reporting option. So if anybody's, you know, changed um, the, their degree type or semester hours from um, what was reported last year, those should be updated as well. Okay. Um, when it comes to the uh, EMIS related fields on the position record, um, I want to talk about that a little bit because I think districts are getting confused in the fact that they feel like they always have to put something in those fields. Um, and just to point out where those are, if I open up a position record, it's these fields here. It's the FTE, the contract amount, the contract work days, and the hours in a day. So these are only necessary if something else other than, than what's on the regular work days field, contract amount, hours in a day, and FTE field, which the FTE field is here. The other fields are on uh, the compensation record that's attached to this position. 
Um, so districts do not have to be always, you know, always entering something in these fields. It's think of these as override fields. So if something needs to be reported differently to EMIS than what's on there, you know, compensation and then that regular FTE field, that's when those these fields need to be used. And there are there are times when that's the case. Um, but you know, we found several districts that are using these, you know, feeling like they have to enter something in every time and that's not the case. Um, I think we've mentioned this multiple times. Um, there, these are custom fields. So we've taken these fields one step further and modified the custom fields to be different or, you know, more meaningful. Um, than just saying contract amount, contract work days, hour in a day, um, full-time equivalents. We've added this EMIS override field so that that kind of, you know, is helpful to districts so that maybe that's, you know, something that will catch their eye and say, hey, we don't have to enter something in there unless it truly needs to be reported differently for EMIS purposes. So if you go to the, the um, under, I'm sorry, under utilities, if you go to, I'm sorry, under system, if you go to a custom field definition, that's where I'm at here. If you scroll down to the position section, um, if I open up this full-time equivalent equivalence custom field, we just simply added EMIS override in front of um, you know, what was there. So we did the same thing to the contract amount, the contract work days, um, and then the hours in a day. So hopefully that, you know, is makes it a little more meaningful and helpful. Um, you know, you can do the same for your uh, districts if you haven't already done so. And that uh, might help them say, hey, you know, I only need to enter something in there if something truly does need to be reported differently. Okay. Yeah, we've, there was a comment about that is, that's been super helpful. So hopefully you find it helpful for your districts too. So what can be done is um, uh, let me, I think there's a, we were prepared to change the custom fields last year, but we were told there was a JIRA issue to do it to the system and we hadn't changed it. It could mess up. Okay. So, um, as long as you don't, as far as like messing, you know, something not being accurately reported for EMIS purposes, as long as, if I go back to one of these, as long as the property name doesn't get changed and it's just the display name, the, the reporting side of things should be fine. Um, what we were finding was the property name was getting changed as well as the display name and that will cause problems. Now, um, without going too deep in the weeds about custom fields, I do know that um, custom fields have caused overall um, issues. I'm not just talking about you know EMIS reporting, um, but there have been issues, several issues where custom fields, um, you know, when it comes to auditing. Um, other areas in the application custom fields have been a pain point. So there are plans and I, I, I can't really speak on when this is going to happen or how it's going to happen. I just know that the development team has been um, looking at custom fields and trying to figure out a better way um, to the custom fields can be handled so that all of those auditing and other issues that it's caused um, are no longer a problem. So uh, again, I, I can't speak in detail because I know I don't think that they've even come to that um, point in their discussion as far as like, you know, what what's going to change and how it's going to look and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but I did want to point that out that eventually um, we might see a different look um, in a different way um, custom fields will be used and handled. 
All right. Um, so again, you know, we will want to clear these fields. And I, I think this is something else that gets missed. Um, you know, districts may not realize that they have something in those EMIS related fields. Again, these are override fields. So these are, this is what's gonna get reported to EMIS. If there's a value in those fields, that gets reported. So, you know, if these aren't cleared or updated year after year, then districts could be reporting information that's several years old. Um, and obviously that's not correct. So you can either use, you know, just filter the grid and clear out those values if there's only a handful of employees that, you know, this pertains to, or you can use mass load um, and create some kind of file, um, some kind of extract and file to load back in to zero all of those out. So we've kind of, you know, stepped you through if you need to use mass load to clear those out, um, you know, from the grid, these are the columns that you'll want to make sure that you have in your spreadsheet. You're going to filter those columns to be greater than zero. Um, and then, you know, maybe even add the, the terminated employees or last paid um, date so that you're getting, um, you know, current employees, if, that, if those are the only employees you want reported, maybe you want to zero everybody out so it doesn't get mistakenly reported on down the line sometime if if somebody comes back um, or something gets changed. You'll then um, create a report and you'll use, again, that the format as Excel field names, and that will extract the proper column headings that you'll you know use when you save that as a CSV file and load that back in. Um, so then once you have that in that you know, report, then you're going to open that up, um, you know, zero all those fields out, and then you will um, use mass, save that as a CSV, use mass load, and this time we're going to choose the importable en entity as position um, to, to zero all those position fields out. All right, so again, you know, if you go to positions, And we do have, you know, all of those override fields on our grid. And if I would, you know, do greater than zero, okay, I don't have, I can see here, I don't have anybody um, with a value in um, the full-time equivalent override field. I have all of these employees that have an amount in the contract amount. Um, so I would want to probably do something with those, those um, uh, records. And then the same with the contract uh, contract work days, and then the hours in a day. So, you know, go through each of those columns and then clear those out or make the necessary changes. Okay. All right, so that's clearing out those EMIS override fields. Um, step seven is um, um, directed towards any in a position, I'm sorry, that that um, had a separation date and a separation reason um, from last, that applied to last reporting year, um, those records can be archived. So they no longer need to be reported. So either you're going to uncheck the reportable boxes, like some of you mentioned before, um, and archive those or simply archive them and they will no longer be reported. And then step eight, um, if an employee left over the summer months and was not reported as separated in a prior fiscal year, then you need to go in to the position record and add a separation date and a reason. So this gets reported this fiscal year as you know being separated and we're gonna leave that for this entire fiscal year. So that needs to be left as is um, in both collections. And then next year, you would you know, refer to step seven and those would be archived or no longer reported. 
Um, step eight, or I'm sorry, step nine then deals with um, employees that are no longer employed in the district or in specific positions. So we need to go to, again, the position record, um, enter a separation reason and a separation date. Um, and we talk about, you know, the status and changing that, um, you know, how to set that. Um, if they had attendance during the year, then they need to remain as a C. Um, and if they are no longer employed with the districts and they had no attendance during the fiscal year, then they can be changed to a U. Um, and then again, just make sure that those get reported for the entire fiscal year that way. And then um, after, you know, the, the next reporting cycle, then we can uh, archive those. When it comes to step 10 is just verifying that your new employees have all the parts um, to be reported correctly. So again, make sure that they on the employee record, they have the um, report to EMIS checkbox mark, the position record, the reportable to EMIS checkbox mark. And then on the compensation, they have the reportable to EMIS box um, marked as well. So again, every position must have at least, you know, a compensation that it's attached to so that both parts get reported and make up um, uh, that uh, uh, employment record. That's the word I was looking for. Um, you also want to make sure that there's a, a credential ID um, for those employees that, um, you know, have a credential ID for uh, um, they hold a certificate, so they, they have that credential ID. I did want to point out, we talked a little bit about this last year, but when it comes to IDs, um, we just want to make sure we've seen times where there's been spaces and it's not really visible to um, the eye here. Um, but if you would either backspace or just completely um, highlight if I would highlight and then backspace to clear this out and then re-enter the um, credential ID and then save the record, a lot of times that does the trick. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, that there's like a, a, a white space here. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you can't truly see it um, looking at the record, but it will cause the the ID to, the credential ID to be missing on the, the your reports and, cause all kinds of trouble. So if somebody's missing one of those, I would try, you know, spacing through and retyping it, um, clearing that out and then saving the record. So um, hopefully that does the trick. Um, where am I at here? Oh, when, when it comes to new employees, again, make sure that they have it on the employee record in that state reporting section. Make sure that they have the level of education, their semester hours, their total experience, authorized experience, and principal experience, if that applies. Um, you know, some new employees that are new to the district might bring with them some kind of experience. So, um, you know, just because they're new doesn't mean that um, you're not having to report something in those fields. And then obviously their education level and semester hours is is required. Uh, when it comes to the position record, make sure that they have a position code, an assignment area, a funding so source code, um, at least one, and a percent, um, and then their FTE. Okay. So just some like quick, you know, things to check and make sure that look over, uh, make sure that those new employees have all those various um, fields entered um, for those that required information. Um, steps, the next um, steps 11, 12, um, and 13 are all reports that can be run then, um, ways that, you, that districts can check information. So once everything has been updated for the new year, um, we have uh, an active position report 
an inactive position report. Um, and this is um, pulling from the position record. On the compensation re uh, record, we have an active contract compensation report, an active non-contract compensation report, and an inactive non-contract compensation report. So these will help districts then verify how that information is getting reported or how it looks. Um, as you all know, we don't have currently um, an exact replica of Perdet. So, you know, in Perdet, you could run that and you could see how all the records looked, you know, get as much detail as you wanted or just run it for errors. Um, we don't, we're not quite there yet, um, but these reports will help. So you can run these and, um, you know, take a look at the information and how it, it kind of collects it all and puts it in one place for districts to verify and look. Um, so if districts aren't um, familiar with these reports, uh, the link is act to the report is actually um, hyperlinked right to uh, the report name. So they can click on this, um, download, um, it'll be downloaded then and they can import that into their um, report manager. Um, just a quick, I have these kind of pulled up here, I think. Where is that? Sorry, it might be my other screen here. So just a quick example of, you know, how the active compensation report looks um, so that districts can kind of, you know, quickly glance at uh, those compensations, you know, all in one place, the positions all in one place and so forth. So, you know, suggest they use these reports just to kind of give them um, a way to double check and look at the information before they run the collection. We also have, um, and that's what um, step 14 is, um, hopefully we're all getting a little more comfortable and familiar with these reports. Again, it's it. I understand it's it's not um, the most user friendly set of reports, and we're aware of that. And we are, you know, eventually going to get to um, more of a per debt kind of looking replacement. But under reports, we have two re uh, reports within the EMIS reports. One's called uh, employee report, and one's called position report. We suggest you know districts run these two reports until they're air free so here's a look at the employee report and you can see here if i scroll all the way down here i have a couple errors if districts have errors on on either of these reports they shouldn't try to run the their data collector collection quite yet we need to make sure that these errors uh, or two reports are air free before they even get to that point. Okay, so here's a look at the position. And if I scroll down, you can see that this report is air free. Now, going back to the report that had the errors, if I scroll up to, to an error, you know, we all know that the error states the same thing and not super, super helpful. Um, so, whoops, sorry for all the scrolling there. But basically it says, this employee will not be reported. Contact your ITC for help, you know. So that's where you come into play um, until we get something a little more meaningful. Um, and hopefully everybody is feeling a little more comfortable. We have, where did I? Put that, sorry, too many tabs, here we go. Um, out on our meetings and trainings page, so I'm on that meetings and trainings page. If I scroll down, there's an ITC only support resources and materials section. And we put this specific checklist in this place for a reason. It's really just meant for you at the ITC, okay? So that's why it's hidden. You know, it's not in the actual user manual. Um, we kind of, you know, this is geared toward you at the ITC level. But this checklist will step you through exactly 
what needs to be done to basically turn on a, a debugging option um, within the report and provide um, a little more detail as to what the system doesn't like or what's missing from those records um, and holding it up from being reported. So I stepped through this last week, but for those of you that weren't, um, haven't been able to, to watch that or weren't on, I'll quickly step through the process. Once you do it a couple of times, it just becomes second nature. So um, not, not too, too much involved here. If you go to system and I go to monitor, if I go to the option that says logging, um, under this name, I'm going to type EMISR. And again, this is all spelled out in that debugging checklist. This very first option here, this EMIS reporting, I'm going to go over to the uh, column that says level, and I'm going to double click on that. And it brings up a drop down arrow. And I'm going to select the option that says debug. And I'm going to click save. Now I'm going to run that those EMIS reports, or in this case, because it was just the EMIS employee report that had on the air, I'm going to click on and generate just that report. My position report looked good. This might take just a second to load. Sorry. What's going to happen then is we're going to go back to system and monitor. In just a second. Maybe longer than a second. Okay, so let's switch over to the checklist and see. Um, this might, I might be able to talk through it. Um, so we we stepped through, we ran the reports, and if this once this completes, we're going to go back to system monitor, but we're going to go to the app log option, and you'll see here um, that when we go to the app log, it actually gives us a little more. You guys see that. I don't know if that helped or not. Um, a little more details of who um, is causing the, the error and then what is missing. So in this case, it says that the, um, the absence link cannot be calculated. There's no active compensations found for, and it gives you the employee and the position number. Um, or there are multiple active compensations with different hours in a day found for the, the employee in this position. Or the um, compensation hours in a day is null or zero, and the EMIS hours in a day is null or zero. So it gives us specific details um, as to you know what is missing or where to look. So it looks like that report completed. So just a quick example to see that live. If I go back to system monitor and I now go to the app log, you can see just that. Um, so I don't know how well you could see, see that um, example in the checklist, but we would then need to go to this employee's position one and and look at their hours in a day. Or in this case, you know, this position or I'm sorry, this employee, this position, and look, you know, at their compensations. Um, we also just recently, um, probably last year at this time, took this one step further. And again, under the USPS and EMIS connection um, section in our 
documentation. We um, have a list or an option that's called EMIS Level 1 Errors Explanation. This then gives us, um, these are right from um, the data collector. So all of the errors, and it's broken down by record type. We have the CI, the staff record, the CK, the employment record, CJ, and CC. So they're broken out by tabs down here at the bottom. Um, but if I have, you know, uh, an error that on my data one collection says, you know, C1040, I can then reference and know that this is the data collector, the severity, this is how it's just the error that's displayed. Um, this is the error message. This is the error uh, description. And if I scroll over here to the, to the right, column E is telling us where to go in state software to look to find um, you know, the field or fields that this error is pertaining to. So if you have, you know, something that's, you know, you're not sure where to go um, to look to, to find what the error is referencing to, use this um, document. Um, again, it's broken down by tabs. So, you know, you'll have to click on the, if it's an error that's, you know, the CK, CI, CJ, CC, you'll have to click on the, the um, correct tab. But this hopefully will also help you um, you know, determine when it comes to the level one collection side, where to go to find, you know, and clean up those errors. Okay. All right. Let's go back to our checklist here. Hmm. Don't want that. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, well, I think I lost my documentation. I'm sorry about that. Um, we will, you will, once you use the, or turn, have the debugging on, um, it is recommended. And we have this in that checklist that I just closed that you go back in and turn, um, that logging, that debugging off. So if I go back to the, once you're done, um, you know, running the reports and getting the errors displayed, um, we would go back and we would, under the name, um, type USPS, I'm sorry, EMISR, and then under this debugging field here, double click, and we're going to go and just uh, make that a space. <clears throat> okay. It doesn't hurt anything. You know, we, we, we talked to the developer developers about this, it doesn't hurt anything, but it is um, kind of running um, more things in the background than are necessary. So we do want to, you know, make sure you turn that off if you've um, turned that on and, and are helping somebody. All right, let me get the documentation open again. Go back to our checklist, and I think we just have. I scroll down here. Um, there's also another. So we talked about step fourteen. Um, there's also um, in the uh, reports shared USPS reports library. Um, there's also another report called EMIS staff report. Um, that allows you to basically check information in, in multiple ways. So, um, you know, again, step 13, 14, and 15 are all reports that can be used that districts can, you know, look at the their the information that's being reported um, and how it looks in different ways. So they're, you know, more than more than ample reports. It's just the look that they want. Step 16 then um, is to be entering any CC um, and or CJ records. Um, so those, as I'm sure all of you know, 
are under core and then EMIS entry. And we have a couple tabs then. Um, so if there are CJ records that need to be added, um, you would click create and then add those. If there are any CC records that need to be added, again, you click on that tab and then um, click create. Remember, when it comes to the collection side, um, these are the only two areas where um, an extract file does need to be created um, and then uploaded to the data collector. So someone, you know, at the district, whether that be the EMIS person, you know, or somebody that handles the collection side or somebody in the treasurer's office, um, if either of those, these two apply, they do have to create the extract and then upload that um, to the data collector in order for that to um, be reported. And then last, um, step six, 17, sorry, um, is you know running that initial staff and course collection in the data collector. So um, you know they're gonna run that as many times as necessary, look at those reports, um, look at their level one um, reports, you know, again, use that, um, that document that we um, talked about when it comes to errors um, to help them cleaning any of those level one errors up. Um, we also have a document that gives um, the field names and locations um, that can be used. Um, and that's also on our, uh, it's linked here and it's also, you know, in under the USPS and EMIS connection. Okay. All right. One thing that I wanted to um, uh, make sure that just kind of talk about um, is IDs. Um, we've had questions and rightfully so about with the new Ratback ID um, and how that is to be reported. Um, is it supposed to be reported? Um, and I just wanted to bring to your attention that there was um, an EMIS news flash that went out um, June 10th, and it kind of addressed um, the wrap back um, expansion reporting. So basically, you know, we, on the staff reporting side, we don't need to worry about reporting a wrap back ID, okay? So we're gonna continue to report things as is, a credential ID, um, a ZID, um, and not have to worry about, so, if, you know, right now, we all know how things can change, um, the wrap back ID. So I wanted to bring, you know, this news flash to your attention. It kind of addresses, um, you know, how all that needs to be reported. Um, when it comes to IDs, if I switch over to um, the area of the documentation and the manual that talks about IDs, you know, there is an employee ID and there's a state staff ID. So we've had some questions and I think it's all, you know, coming to fruition because of um, the, the whole wrap back ID about IDs in general. So I put together um, a, a little uh, document here that I'll post out under the supporting documents um, for today's session that kind of steps you through employee uh, EMIS IDs. So the EMIS ID and the credential ID. So if there is a value in the EMIS ID on the employee record, this is treated as one of those override fields, okay? So if I go to an employee's record, this value here is what should be reported um, when it comes to the EMIS ID, because this is the override field. Going back to the document, if there is no EMIS ID, entered for an employee, which there probably aren't, shouldn't be many of those, then the EMIS reporting ID is based on the system configuration, EMIS reporting configuration 
reporting ID. Okay, so if we follow all that, we go to system, we go to configuration, we go to EMIS reporting configuration, and this reporting ID. So we have a couple different options, the SSN, the employee ID, or the credential ID. Okay. So if that EMIS ID is blank, then the EMIS ID is determined by how that EMIS reporting configuration reporting ID is set. So we kind of break this down even further then, if that reporting ID is set to credential ID, if the a credential ID has a value, that's what's sent to the data collector. If there is no credential ID and there is a ZID, then the ZID is what's sent to the data collector. So I'm sure that you guys are all familiar with what I'm talking about, but just to make sure. So we're talking about this field here. And then if we scroll down to the bottom, this non-certificate employee ID. So those are the two fields that that's talking about. If neither of these are present, then the SSN is what's reported. If that reporting ID is set to employee ID, then the employee number is what's sent to the data collector. If there is no employee number, then the SSN is reported. When it comes to the credential ID, um, the state staff ID, we also send this to EMIS. For that value, if the employee has a credential ID, then that's the value that's sent as the credential ID. If the employee has a ZID, then that's what's sent as the credential ID. If neither of those are present and the employee is included in a collection, then the ZID gets assigned. Okay? Awesome. I can see, you know, from the chat, there's this, hopefully you find this helpful and it looks like um, it will be. So I will put this, um, it was kind of a last minute when we had some questions come in. I thought, you know what, let's try to spell this out and put it in some kind of, you know, document for you to reference. Um, I think I can improve upon it a little bit. I kind of, <laughs> to be honest, threw it together at the last minute, just so we had something um, for today. Um, I might even put something out um, under the USPS and EMIS connection. Um, I can put something called IDs or something here, another um, chapter or page so that um, this is all spelled out. But I might improve upon this just a little bit so it's e a little easier to follow. Um, I'll put this document out as it is out on our um, meetings and trainings page so that you have have that to reference to. Um, and then we'll put something in the documentation so that you have it as well. Yeah, great. I That's a good idea. I'll, I'll link it to the employee record. That's, that's a good idea. Um, where we talk about IDs, you know, something like that, where it'll make sense. Um, lastly, um, you know, kind of, um, expanding upon IDs um, in other areas when it comes to state software and fiscal in general. Um, I did want to um, mention that registration for the OETSA conference um, has opened up. The conference is the 11th through the 13th this year. Um, they, we are having, um, state software is having four sessions, two of them being um, ESS, so the employee self-service, you know, as a whole, and then the employee timesheets. Um, we also have a payroll law session, um, cross-check for fiscal staff, um, VLOOKUP and using pivot tables in Excel. Um, 
we are going to have a, just a, an ITC only um, session, sort of like what we did last year from four to five. And this is a panel discussion about um, converting from other softwares to other software options to state software. Um, so we're going to have, there's a couple districts that are um, currently in that process. Um, so we're going to have them available to kind of have a round table and have some discussion on uh, what that looks like and what that process is and, and so forth. Um, and then on Friday, we have um, best practices to prevent fraud. Um, and then the other two sessions that SSDT are, is doing um, is dealing with the employer distribution and re uh, employer retirement share. And then kind of following the, that up on the USAS side with pending transactions um, and account change. Um, we do have, and the reason I brought this up, was a wrap back session. So that's um, here. So somebody from DEW is coming to talk about um, the wrap back process and those IDs. So that um, could be helpful. And then we also have um, a session that's kind of a crossover session that is um, intersections between e EMIS and finance. So kind of the whole reason I brought it up was we to talk about, you know, the, the rat back session and then the EMIS session that we're doing. Um, and I forgot, I'm sorry, we have another payroll and EMIS session called Bridging the Gap. So, um, you know, lots going on in the, the EMIS sort of fiscal um, realm that, that hopefully you'll find helpful. All right, are there any questions about anything that we talked about this morning? I know that was a lot to cover and it went a little over, so I apologize. Um, looking forward then to next Friday, we have a session called um, Report Generation and Best Practices. And this is a deeper dive into USAS report generation and best practices when generating those reports. So um, hopefully you'll, um, you know, jump on next Friday at nine o'clock and um, learn everything about report generation and best practices um, when it comes to the USAS side. All right, I don't see any, any questions in chat. Um, once again, we thank you for your, your time this morning. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk to everybody soon. Thank you.